Okay, great. So it's my pleasure to welcome Neil Turok to give the 14th Osmo lecture on the idea of a CP symmetric universe. Uh, but the, today I see the title is slightly different, a minimal standard model lambda CDM cosmology. And yes. Neil currently holds the Higgs chair of theoretical physics at the University of Edinburgh, where he has been since 2020. His research interests are in mathematical physics and early universe physics, including the cosmological constant and a cyclic model of the universe. Neil grew up in South Africa and did his higher studies at Cambridge and Imperial, followed by a postdoc in Santa Barbara and an associate scientist position at Fermilab. In 1994, he was appointed professor of physics at Princeton University. And in 97, he moved to the University of Cambridge as chair of mathematical physics. During 2008 to 19, he served as the director of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Neil has very distinguished research achievements to his credit. In the 90s, along with his collaborators, he showed the correlation between polarization and temperature and isotropies of the microwave background, and subsequently also developed a theory of open inflation. With Stephen Hawking, he developed the so-called Hawking Turok instant solutions, which can be instant on solutions, which can describe the birth of an inflationary universe. He co-authored the idea of an egg pyrotic universe and along with Paul Steinhardt also proposed the cyclic model for the universe. Neil has also written popular books in cosmology and in 2003, he founded the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences in South Africa. He's a recipient of the 1992 Maxwell model of the Institute of Physics, the 2008 Ted Prize for his work in mathematical physics, and the Lane Anderson Award for his book, The Universe Within, From Quantum to Cosmos. We are really delighted to have Neil Turok with us today and look forward to his exciting lecture. Over to you. Well, thank, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I realize this topic is not um, very firmly within your, uh, within your normal uh, focus, but um, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to try to broaden your focus a little. Um, and I think the spirit of this work is certainly uh, compatible with the spirit of, uh, of, as I understand it, of what motivates you, namely trying to find uh, simpler and more elegant explanations for basic physics. So I've changed the title a little bit. Uh, this is the title I'm commonly using now. Uh, let me just close the window, it's a bit windy. Uh, there we are. Um, and the point is really that uh, we live in a tremendously exciting time because observations are revealing the structure of the universe on very large scales and also on very small scales, uh, namely the Large Hadron Collider uh, results. And in both cases, they point to a um, very economical description of nature a surprisingly economical one, uh, which is really not what was expected according to the dominant uh, paradigms. And so in particle physics, people expected to see supersymmetry, um, additional particles like dark matter particles, or, or even uh, uh, indications of extra dimensions uh, at, the, uh, at the LHC. And instead, nothing was seen except the uh, the Higgs boson, of course, which was postulated uh, over 50 years ago. Um, and in cosmology, it's also very similar, as, as I'll explain. Uh, the description of the universe, which seems to work remarkably well, the LCDM description, shows no signs of, uh, of uh, inconsistencies, so maybe some tiny indications now, but not yet uh, statistically uh, compelling indications of problems. Um, on the contrary, it works remarkably well over a very broad range of scales. So uh, Latham and I started uh, rethinking things a few years ago, uh, really in the spirit of saying, what is the minimal 
possible explanation of uh, particle physics and of cosmology, which is consistent with everything uh, we see. And indeed, maybe nature has chosen a minimal option. Uh, now, I should emphasize this is a very dangerous game because we are not allowing ourselves the freedom which uh, most people allow themselves, which is to introduce new particles, uh, forces, uh, couplings, uh, parameters, uh, initial conditions, uh, and even extra dimensions. We're, we're not doing any of that. Instead, we're trying to say, given what we see, uh, uh, given the ingredients of physics that we already know, um, can we reconcile those ingredients without adding anything extra or, or very modest uh, additions, no new particles, no new forces, no new dimensions? Can we reconcile the physics we know with uh, the universe we see? Uh, it's a dangerous game, as you'll see, both on the theoretical side, whether or not there's some theoretical inconsistency which will appear, uh, and on the observational side, there may be some observation that rules out our picture. Um, but it is a very um, complete, let me just see, it's not allowing me to change the screen. Okay, there. So to, uh, and, and, and let me just encourage anybody to jump in, uh, ask questions, interrupt, uh, make a complaint, uh, very happy to to have uh, more interaction with the audience, uh, especially if anything's unclear or if you disagree with anything. Um, so this, this picture summarizes the current consensus, which is that the Big Bang singularity is indescribable. That's what a uh, string theorist would tell you. It's simply too difficult. Um, and that sometime after the singularity, a phase of the universe called inflation uh, commenced, and this blew, blew the universe up into a huge, uh, flat, uh, uh, homogeneous isotropic structure. And subsequent to that, when the inflation ended, uh, the energy in the inflationary fields was released into hot radiation, and then the standard hot Big Bang phase began, leading to eventually to the universe we now see today. Um, so this is the consensus. I'm going to uh, question that consensus, first of all, by actually trying to describe the singularity. And what we'll see is that um, a rather elegant uh, and, and very economical description of it emerges, which, is, uh, which appears to be consistent with a conjecture made a long time ago by Roger Penrose called the vile curvature hypothesis. Uh, secondly, I'm not going to use inflation at all, uh, but what I am going to do is, uh, instead I'm going to simply extrapolate the hot Big Bang era all the way back to the singularity, and as I say, find a rather elegant description of the singularity. Um, so we won't have any uh, inflation at all, and instead we're going to have to discover a completely new mechanism uh, for explaining the large-scale homogeneity, isotropy, and flatness of the universe, which we will do. And secondly, a completely new mechanism for explaining the structure, formation of structure in the universe. And again, we will do that. And the remarkable thing about our new mechanism is that it actually predicts quantitatively um, the, the fluctuations we see on large scales. And it can be, in principle, tested by uh, increasing precision in theory and uh, and observation. So, um, just to summarize, inflation was a great idea and drove many observational programs, like the Planck uh, satellite. But in retrospect, uh, I think um, many people are now concluding there's rather little evidence that inflation actually happened. Why? Because as it turned out, the observations are very well fit by a vanilla Lambda CDM model, uh, which could have been invented, in fact, was invented long before inflation. And there's just a super abundance of inflationary models with uh, many parameters, assumptions, fields, and so on. 
and no evidence for any particular one of them. Uh, there's no sign, uh, even stronger argument is that there is now no sign of inflation's smoking gun signal, long wavelength gravitational waves produced during this early desitter-like phase. And uh, so here is the latest data. Uh, this has surprisingly few uh, citations. You know, people are writing thousands of papers on inflation, but not uh, typically not citing the latest evidence against inflation. Uh, it just came out last year that the upper uh, the upper bound on the contribution of gravitational waves to the cosmic microwave anisotropies is now just over 3%, uh, shown by the blue contours here. Uh, Phi-squared inflation is, uh, is now strongly ruled out. So please don't teach uh, Phi-squared inflation in any introductory cosmology courses anymore. Uh, it's ruled out. Um, and what's even more exciting is that the observers anticipate that this limit will fall to by more than an order of magnitude over the next four years and should go down to 0.3%. Uh, uh, and at that point, really, uh, the very large number of inflation models will be ruled out and uh, inflation is is under will be under increasing uh, pressure from observations. So um, just to go back to this, uh, I can do my full screen again. Um, the other point, and I could add many many other points, but for a long time, uh, many people have questioned inflation because there is no measure known on inflationary universes. Uh, so inflation is supposed to make the universe homogeneous, isotropic, and flat. But how homogeneous, how isotropic, and how flat has never really been defined because you need a measure on the space of on the initial conditions for universes, uh, or even worse, uh, multiverses. And there, so far, nobody has proposed a satisfactory measure. Uh, one might add to this point that inflation never dealt with the initial singularity, which is probably the greatest puzzle about the universe uh, that we know. Um, so here is vanilla lambda CDM. This is a phenomenological description, which, as I mentioned before, is remarkably uh, accurate and uh, currently seems to be consistent with all uh, observations. So I'm going to take it as a challenge uh, what, to explain lambda CDM and all of its parameters uh, from first principles with a bare minimum of assumptions. So there are three parameters in lambda CDM for the energy content. Uh, that is a cosmological constant. Um, the ratio of dark matter to baryon density, um, and then the number of baryons per photon. So these numbers presumably should come from fundamental physics, uh, and uh, we don't have any evidence for anything beyond these three numbers uh, as far as the matter and energy content of the universe. Two numbers describe the fluctuations or the geometry, the large-scale geometry of the universe. One is uh, the fluctuation in the Newtonian potential. So in units where C is one, this is dimensionless, and its variance can be expressed as an integral over wave number. So we usually write it as an integral over log wave number with an amplitude and uh, an additional factor which gives a tilt uh, you might also call this a critical exponent or scaling exponent. And, uh, and, and in fact, that's the interpretation I'll give at the end of the talk. So there are two numbers here which come in. One is the overall amplitude. And the second number is the um, anomalous dimension or critical exponent, which tells you the scaling with K. Uh, the first number is about uh, 3 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, and that corresponds to the 
large scale anisotropy of about 10 to the minus five or 30 microkelvin. Uh, the critical exponent is a small negative number, which is measured at around uh, 0 0.0, minus 0 0.04. So as I'll explain at the end of the talk, uh, Latham and I have a new explanation for both of these numbers, which in which they are expressed in terms of uh, coupling constants in the standard model of particle physics. And uh, rather remarkably, the predictions agree with the Planck uh, measurements. Um, many quantities in cosmology are consistent with zero. So uh, there is, seems to be no spatial curvature, or at least hasn't been measured yet. Uh, very high precision, better than, uh, better than a percent. Um, there's no deviation in the composition of the universe from place to place. Uh, that uh, the universe seems to have this have emerged from the Big Bang with the same basic composition everywhere. Uh, there are no gravitational waves, as I've mentioned, long wavelength gravity, and so on. So very many quantities are consistent with zero. The simplicity of this phenomenology strongly suggests that we apply Occam's razor to our space of theories and um, we we simply refuse to consider complicated theories. Uh, now, of course, that's the opposite to what people are actually doing. Um, most uh, The most popular theories, including string theory, involve very, very large number of extra parameters, assumptions, fields, particles, and so on, and in fact, a multiverse. And I just want to emphasize this. There's absolutely no evidence for any of that. So uh, I, I have become a strongly Occam-oriented theorist. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and I think imposing that discipline on yourself actually is, uh, in our experience, a very good stimulus to uh, creativity. Neil, could I ask you a quick question? Sure. Uh, uh, the total number of particles in the observed universe is around 10 to the 80. Did you have to assume this as a free parameter, or can you predict this? Uh, in principle, it's predicted. It's actually not um, well. It's so it, it's really this number. Okay, so the number of baryons per photon is about ten to the ninety photons yeah. in the universe, and uh, and um, uh, there's about ten to the minus ten baryons per photon. So this is one of these three numbers. I'm actually not, th this is perfectly explicable within the framework I will describe, which is the standard model coupled to gravity, uh, when you include right-handed neutrinos, uh, as we have to do to explain neutrino oscillations. So there is a, a sort of very minimal explanation for this. Unfortunately, there are enough free parameters that you can just fit this number. And so I'm not I'm not going to dwell on this particular number in this talk. I'll I'll focus on on other problems. But yes, in principle, let's say it the following way: that in the number of particles we see, um, namely baryons and uh, electrons in in the universe, um, that number is perfectly explicable in terms of a hot Big Bang involving only Einstein gravity and the standard model uh, once you. you include right-handed neutrinos. Um, okay, so when we look back to the Big Bang, this is what we see, a uh, simple pattern of anisotropies. When we take the Fourier transform, we get these power spectra with beautiful oscillations. Sometimes people say these curves are evidence for inflation. That is absolutely untrue. Uh, these these uh, curves are a result of acoustic oscillations of the plasma. Um, they have nothing to do with inflation. All they verify is that the primordial power spectrum of fluctuations is very nearly scale invariant and has this t small extra power on red or on long wavelengths. So uh, I was lucky enough in the 90s to calculate this curve for the first time. And um, so the beautiful thing is that if you fit the cosmological parameters, these five numbers, to the, the lower curve, then the upper curve is an absolute prediction. There are no free parameters. 
and you see it fits beautifully. And this is partly what convinced me that what's going on in the universe is something extraordinarily simple and uh, that Einstein's theory and, uh, you know, basic physics we know gets you a long way to understand uh, everything around us. So in this talk, I'm going to describe a unified framework and, and it's absolutely unified. It's very rigid, so it's, it's hard to modify it. Uh, many things can only be understood by uh, from the big principles. You know, it's not an effective field theory. It's a highly constrained uh, unified framework, which connects the standard model to the lambda CDF model. In principle, explains all five parameters in that model, or at least uh, interprets those parameters. In 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 some cases, there are free parameters in the standard model which can fit. Uh, the five parameters, uh, based on extrapolating the radiation epoch all the way back to the singularity. We will assume no extra particles except right-handed neutrinos, which we need for neutrino oscillations. We explain why there are three generations of elementary particles. We predict the fluctuations don't require inflation, and we certainly don't require a multiverse. So here we are. This is the uh, our past... Uh, light cone, the green light cone. If we look back to um, the Planck time, then uh, the visible universe, uh, then our past light cone mm. encompasses a region about 10 microns across. If we then uh, evolve that region forward, it, it is this uh, 20 gigaparsec region surrounding us, our, uh, roughly speaking, our Hubble volume. Um, and, and of course, we see all these uh, galaxies along that light cone, which uh, fill out our, which now fill out our uh, Hubble volume. So, uh, so we're going to take this point of view that there was nothing dramatic apart from uh, the, the radiation epoch all the way back to the Planck time. And um, the large scale structure we see is kind of like a microscope uh, amplifying the small scale fluctuations at the Planck time into the large scale structure we see now. Um, and as I'll explain, we, we think we have a new explanation for, for those fluctuations uh, quantitatively. So let me begin with, with how we started, which is somewhat surprising, which is to think about dark matter. You know, I always thought dark matter required an extra particle beyond the standard model. But when you think carefully, uh, there already is a very good candidate for the dark matter within the standard model, as long as you include right-handed neutrinos in the standard model. Uh, now, this has been known since the 1970s that to explain the small uh, neutrino oscillations which are observed in the atmosphere and in solar neutrino measurements, to, to explain those, the simplest explanation is that there are heavy right-handed neutrinos, and the left-handed neutrinos, which would be massless in the absence of right-handed neutrinos, these left-handed neutrinos can oscillate into virtual right-handed neutrinos. They will oscillate for a very short amount of time because the if these right-handed neutrinos are extremely heavy, uh, and then, of course, they will decay back into uh, left-handed neutrinos. So there's this uh, neutrino oscillation diagram involving the Higgs uh, expectation value through which these can couple. And it was known since the 1970s as that this mechanism explains in a very simple way why we would expect the left the observed neutrino masses to be so light, uh, because the heavier this particle is, the less the mixing and uh, the lighter the neutrino masses. So this is called the seesaw mechanism. And uh, the special thing about right-handed neutrinos is they carry no gauge charges. And so they really are immediately a very good candidate for dark matter. Um, what was missing was any explanation for the abundance of the right-handed neutrinos. Um, in the standard picture, Abundances are determined by thermal equilibrium. And if you want one of these right-handed neutrinos to be the dark matter, you want it to be stable. 
And that means you want to switch off this decay process. Sorry? Sorry, is there a question? No? Okay. Um, please please well, do. Feel... Go ahead, please. I muted. Somebody. Oh, okay. No problem. Um, yes, yeah, so if you want this to be dark matter, you want it to be stable, so you must switch off this decay vertex. But if you switch off the decay vertex, then of course the left-handed one will not oscillate into the right-handed one. So if the right-handed neutrino, if one of them is stable, then it actually follows that one of the left-handed neutrinos is massless. Um, and um, But it also follows that that right-handed neutrino was actually never in thermal equilibrium. And therefore, you cannot calculate its abundance by assuming thermal equilibrium in the, in the early universe. So for this reason, this solution to the dark matter puzzle seems to have been overlooked. Um, now, what we realized is that if we study a radiation-dominated universe, um, it has a remarkably simple uh, behavior at the singularity, namely the scale factor is linear in the conformal time at uh, t goes to zero. So the Big Bang looks like a simple zero of the scale factor. And if you study the the Friedman equation, you find there is a uh, the solution can be analytically continued through t equals zero to a universe before the Big Bang, which you can think of as sort of mirror mirror image of the post Bang universe. And so this is the picture of the maximal analytic extension of the uh, standard Big Bang. And as I'll explain, we, we don't actually take this mirror copy very seriously. You can think about it as really a mathematical device which is used to impose um, a special kind of boundary condition by the method of images. Uh, so just as when you solve electromagnetism in the presence of a mirror, uh, you can, um, if you're right-handed, you can make a left-handed copy of yourself, put it behind the mirror at the same distance, and then throw the mirror away and just solve the empty space Maxwell equation, and uh, and you'll get the correct result for the uh, what you see in the mirror. So uh, in the same way, we consider the analytic extension of a standard uh, Big Bang cosmology through t equals zero, we solved the Dirac equation for right-handed neutrinos on the space-time. And the what you find is that there's a isometry of the extended space-time under time reversal. And this allows you to define and impose a CPT symmetry on the uh, vacuum state. And that turns out to select a, a particular vacuum state in which the abundance of right-handed neutrinos is absolutely determined. Uh, one could say that these right-handed neutrinos are produced as Hawking radiation uh, arising from the Big Bang itself, and just the fact that the co cosmological background is time-dependent. So when we uh, did this calculation, we found that if, if we fit the right-handed neutrino mass to the observed uh, value of uh, omega in nutri in uh, in dark matter, observed density of dark matter, that determines the neutrino right-handed neutrino mass to be five times ten to the eight GeV. So that's an interesting number. Uh, it's uh, so far difficult to test uh, because uh, these particles do not couple to the standard model. But uh, but you know it's a definite and very clean uh, prediction. Uh, so. Our hypothesis is that there are three right-handed neutrinos. Two of them are enough to explain the uh, mass differences between um, E, mu, and tau neutrinos. So two of these right-handed neutrino masses are enough to explain that. The third uh, right-handed neutrino is stable, doesn't mix, and, uh, and provides a dark matter with this mass. So, uh, as I've already explained, if um, the right hand, one of the right-handed neutrinos is stable, it follows that the action has a Z2 symmetry under reversing this right-handed neutrino. 
And from that, it follows that the lightest neutrino is actually massless. And these are the measurements of uh, neutrino masses. So we know two mass differences coming from atmospheric and solar oscillation experiments. Our prediction then is that the lightest one is zero. And that allows us to predict the sum of neutrino masses. And amazingly, this sum is about to be measured in uh, galaxy surveys. Uh, so depending on the ordering of these uh, neutrino masses, you have the normal hierarchy or the inverted hierarchy. So there are two predictions, two numbers which are predicted. Um, probably more likely is the normal hierarchy in which you get the, the smaller number. And on the right-hand side, you see current observations, which are trying to constrain the total sum of neutrino masses. Uh, the current constraints are not very good. Uh, they're even favoring a negative sum, which doesn't make any sense. Um, but, uh, but that is going to rapidly improve with the Euclid satellite and LSST survey. So what is anticipated is... Sorry, a quick survey. question, if you don't mind. Sorry. Sorry? The two light neutrinos, which are massive, can, yes. can the two masses be equal or they must be different? Uh, no, they're measured. Uh, I mean, it, in our picture, the um, the lightest one is zero, right? So then from observed mass difference measurements, we know one of the mass differences is large and one of them is small. So if you uh, essentially take the square root these, these are mass squared, but if you take the square root of this number, it'll give you an idea of the mass difference um, between these two neutrinos and, uh, and so these. M M3 and M2 cannot be equal? N not if you believe M1 is zero. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank and I think, uh, no, I think he, actually, I, I think if they are equal, then you will have trouble obtaining... Um, uh, three, you know, the, the, this one is not double that, I don't mm -hmm. think, the mass difference. Yeah, I doubt it is compatible with the data to have Okay, thank you. Them equal. Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, so these experiments are, over the next uh, three to five years, will really start homing in on the sum of neutrino masses. And if you get a narrow Gaussian around this value, uh, that will be very strong evidence that the lightest one is indeed massless. And that will be very strong, although indirect evidence, that the dark matter is a right-handed neutrino. So this is quite exciting. Uh, the, these are projections by uh, a group at Harvard uh, that the error bar in the sum of neutrino masses anticipated from this experiment is 0 0.01 eV. And uh, as I said, the value predicted is 0 0.06. So, so it's about a five sigma. Um, you know, what they anticipate is that this would be approximately a, a five sigma measurement. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's really amazing. Now, I should caution that this depends quite heavily on modeling the uh, galaxy clustering within uh, clusters of galaxies and the influence, the very small influence of neutrino masses on that clustering. And so both the uh, LSST and Euclid teams are now very heavily involved in modeling this in great detail. Um, and I think both are a little nervous about this quoted error bar, whether it really will be achieved. Um, okay, so that's the, the dark matter, and you, you see, thinking about the dark matter and this unusual production mechanism made us think more strongly about the singularity itself and what, what's going on at the singularity. Uh, now, the key point w which explains why the singularity is actually analytic in conformal time is that uh, pure radiation is conformally symmetric. So the trace of the stress tensor is exactly zero. Um, and if the trace of the stress tensor is zero, then the Ricci scalar is zero by the Einstein equation. And that results in an analytic 
scale factor near uh, t equals zero. Um, and we are going to, we have been adopting that principle as a very fundamental principle that, and if you think about it, it makes perfect sense that if you want to explain the Big Bang singularity, uh, in a way, your only hope of doing that is to, uh, would be if the matter does not, is not sensitive to the overall scale. Uh, the overall scale of the universe is going to zero, the scale factor is going to zero, but if the matter is completely insensitive to that, it means that the matter sees a uh, perfectly regular metric, uh, even at t equals zero, and that gives you at least a, a chance of describing uh, what happened at the Big Bang singularity itself. So there's a very striking fact, which is if you take a perfect fluid with uh, uh, exactly traceless stress tensor, so P is exactly equal to one third rho, uh, uh, then um, this matter has local conformal symmetry. So if you perform a vial transformation, uh, the equations of motion of the fluid are invariant. And then it turns out it's been well known for a very long time, though not interpreted this way, that there is an infinity of solution to the Einstein equations, which are analytic at t equals zero. And so here's a metric. Uh, so this is this is the solution of the Einstein equations with uh, traceless uh, stress tensor fluid, fluid with traceless stress tensor. Uh, here's the scale factor. And then the metric is a completely regular four metric um, written in synchronous gauge. It has the property that it it's analytic at t equals zero and uh, symmetric under about t. So t goes to minus t uh, is a symmetry of, of this metric. So basically there are exactly the number of uh, solutions of the Einstein equations, which you would expect uh, as uh, the general solution, once you've imposed t goes to minus t symmetry. Um, so this, the solution we're using for the background is in no way special. It is, uh, it is uh, surrounded by a set of non-zero measure co uh, containing uh, absolutely, well, containing the the right number of solutions you would expect uh, for the full nonlinear Einstein equations. So this the, the the fact that this is a solution was actually known um, since the 60s. The only difference is people wrote it in proper time and proper time is t squared. And so this symmetry under t goes to minus t uh, was not evident. And I think it's really only in our work that this symmetry under reversing conformal time became uh, emphasized. Um, so what this means is if I consider a real time path integral with an initial and a final um, three geometry, let me show you a picture. So initial three geometry, final three geometry. If I impose, uh, t, uh, if I impose that the initial and final three geometries are identical and I try to find a Lorentzian four manifold which is compatible with that boundary data and solves the Einstein equations, uh, this is what I'll find, that there is a time reversal symmetric uh, four manifold, which is a saddle to the real, real time path integral for gravity. Uh, you can check that with this metric, uh, uh, which is uh, expressed as a Taylor series around t equals zero, uh, the vial tensor um, vanishes at t equals zero. It's just a result of this uh, t goes to minus t symmetry. And uh, so it vanishes exactly at t equals zero. And uh, this means that Penrose conjecture actually follows from the path integral for gravity with, uh, with CPT symmetric boundary conditions. So I think that's quite remarkable. Penrose was not uh, making, the, it was making this conjecture on purely classical uh, grounds only thinking about a one-sided universe, um, and uh, but but uh, it it is a consequence of of what we're doing. Furthermore, uh, wilder metrics like BKL or mixed master metrics are excluded because they are just not genuine saddles of the path integral, 
And so the path integral includes quantum interference. A uh, generic path in the path integral is not regular. It's uh, not even differentiable. But the interference is what uh, results in uh, saddle points being regular solutions of the Einstein equations. And in this case, the interference would just cancel out uh, BKL or mixed master metrics. They're not genuine saddles and so uh, don't need to be considered. So I think it's a remarkably simple picture. There's a lot that needs to be done to, uh, to verify all of this, but uh, it's quite exciting that we're now seeing a way to make sense of the Big Bang singularity itself. And this is how uh, Latham and I picture it, is that the Big Bang is an analytic mirror. There's really only a, one universe after the Big Bang, and then somehow the method of images is, allows you to impose uh, CPT symmetric boundary conditions. By the way, let me say that um, in the usual conception of initial conditions for the universe, say prior to inflation, you you make assumptions about how the universe emerged when it was very tiny. And I think actually that's exactly the wrong place to impose boundary conditions because that epoch is when uh, quantum gravity fluctuations were certainly large and therefore there isn't in any sense a single classical space-time. There surely should be a, a whole superposition of quantum uh, space-times uh, around the Big Bang, this should be a very, very big effect. And so you don't want to impose uh, boundary conditions, classical boundary conditions at the Big Bang itself. It's a, you, you want to allow, for example, the um, proper time since the Big Bang. You know, if I'm up here and I want to know how long ago was the Big Bang, that proper time should be a quantum fluctuating variable. Um, and so it's very important to impose boundary conditions which do not um, fix that number or attempt to fix that number. So here's a picture of the path integral, the real-time path integral for gravity. Um, and this would be uh, an attempt to describe um, uh, the Big Bang singularity within such a description as an analytic solution of the Einstein equation, which nevertheless has a conformal zero. Um, uh, and and it's, it's kind of interesting that if you want to describe the present, you know, where, where there's no time um, between the initial and final three geometry, that's also possible. It just has a different relationship between the initial and final uh, Fierbein or, or scale factor. So using this picture, you know, can we explain anything or make any new predictions. And so what I'm going to start with explaining is yes, indeed, uh, we claim there's a new explanation for the large scale geometry of the cosmos and it uses uh, gravitational entropy. So having understood this, uh, uh, what are the right boundary conditions at the Big Bang, uh, namely these analytic um, CPD symmetric boundary conditions, we are in a position now to consider, um, to calculate the gravitational entropy of uh, various cosmologies. And this then provides a measure on possible universes. So here's the path integral for gravity and the standard model. Um, of course, there's still issues about whether this exists at all. Uh, my own point of view is that the Lorentzian path integral uh, is uh, the most likely one to exist. Uh, the Euclidean one almost certainly doesn't exist, but is uh, nevertheless very useful as uh, in discussing saddle points of the Lorentzian path integral. So um, I'm going to cut a long story short here. Uh, we've written, me and my collaborators have written quite a few papers on the Lorentzian path integral for gravity as applied to cosmology. Um, but what we want to do now is to use this path integral to uh, understand gravitational entropy, uh, because entropy is going to literally count how many four geometries there are with various properties, various macroscopic properties. 
so Hawking, of course, pioneered this um, through an ex extremely elegant um, approach, uh, which is sort of shockingly simple uh, conceptually, which is that the partition function, of course, is just the trace of e to the minus beta h in thermodynamics, where beta is the inverse temperature. But in, um, in and, and that's equal to e to the minus free energy uh, in any thermodynamic system. But um, in the case of a, a reparametrization invariant system like gravity, the Hamiltonian is zero. So the partition function literally is just a trace over all states. It counts the number of states. And then when you write the free energy, e to the minus f over t, if you drop the energy term because that's zero, this is just e to the s. Uh, so the gravitational entropy is just uh, the log of the number of states uh, compatible with certain macroscopic parameters. So um, this uh, approach to backhole thermodynamics um, has, has uh, been used for uh, decades and uh, is extremely successful in, in various respects. Uh, and all we have done is generalize this to cosmology. In fact, it's very surprising it wasn't done before. Uh, as you'll see, it's, uh, it, it's really not difficult to generalize this discussion to cosmology. Um, so the only case that cosmology, cosmology that was studied prior to our work was De Sitter. And uh, the way this was done was just to analytically continue global time to imaginary values. The de Sitter geometry is a saddle point of the Einstein action, Einstein lambda action. Um, and when you analytically continue de Sitter, you get a four sphere. And so now all you do is calculate the exponent in the path integral IS, which is minus the Euclidean action. You calculate the Euclidean Einstein lambda action and you find this uh, standard result that uh, the Euclidean action is uh, is negative and goes like one over rho lambda. And this is uh, the exponent is then interpreted as the de Sitter entropy, which is about three times 10 to the 122 for the observed value of lambda. Um, so this very large entropy, much larger than the entropy of radiation we see in our Hubble volume, um, but it should be emphasized this is not a realistic universe. It, 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 the, the actual universe seems to have come out of a Big Bang. Uh, it's not a pure de Sitter space. So Latham and I decided to generalize the calculation for a realistic universe. Um, and uh, we know that we already know the Lorentzian solutions for realistic cosmology. It's just what all cosmologists use every day. And uh, so the scale factor here expressed in conformal, the metric expressed in conformal time is just a static metric with a um, space of constant curvature in space and then time in the usual way. Uh, um, with a scale factor. So if you then write down the Friedman equations, which are just the uh, equation for the saddle point of the, of the Einstein-Hilbert action, um, uh, Friedman equation looks like this. And as soon as you write down this Friedman equation, you, you should realize that it's analytically solvable because this is just a particle in a quartic potential. And that problem was solved in the 19th century. So the general solution of this equation for arbitrary radiation, matter, space curvature, and the cosmological constant uh, is a Jacobi elliptic function. And uh, so we notice this. Uh, it's amazing it wasn't noticed before. Uh, and then even more amazing is Jacobi elliptic functions have uh, very special analytic properties, including that they are uh, periodic in imaginary time. And so because they have a period in imaginary time, that defines the temperature, uh, the Hawking temperature. And by calculating the action over one period, you get the entropy. So in real time, they look like this. Here is our cosmos. It came out of a big bang, which is a simple zero in the scale factor. 
heads up to a simple pole. That's the future of De Sitter space. And uh, if we go back through the Big Bang, of course, it's just the, the opposite. Um, other solutions are like De Sitter space would be the orange dashed curve or an oscillating universe that, that recollapses, closed universe that recollapses would look like this. So um, what we're interested in is the properties of these solutions in imaginary, in, in complex time, and in particular imaginary time. Uh, and they are doubly periodic in the complex T-plane, and their only singularities are simple poles. That's easy to see from the differential equation. <clears throat> the imaginary time period um, uh, and the action computed over an imaginary time period determine the Hawking temperature and the gravitational entropy. So here they are in the complex T-plane. The complex T-plane is tiled by a rectangle. And um, if we look on the real T-axis, we come out of a big bang and we go to a de Sitter uh, infinity, a de Sitter blow up. If we go up the imaginary axis, it's a similar behavior. And then the statement is that the uh, gravitational action is calculated by integrating over a loop in, in uh, imaginary time. And certain things are clear, namely uh, from Cauchy's theorem, the result of that integral is uh, topological, namely any deformation of the contour, which wraps once around that fundamental domain, will give you the same answer. So uh, for every cosmology, we have a Euclidean instanton um, and its shape and size are determined by the radiation matter curvature and lambda, and we can compute its uh, Euclidean action, and this gives us the gravitational entropy. So we calculated these uh, this analytically for general cosmology, uh, for all of these conserved quantities. We also discussed inhomogeneities and anisotro anisotropies just by perturbing uh, the fluid and the metric um, and discussed these in cosmological perturbation theory. And we found that SG is greatest for a spatially flat, homogeneous and isotropic universe. And also, um, so um, this, yeah, so the first result is it was quite surprising that um, the, um, the entropy is greatest for a flat universe. Uh, and also one which is homogeneous and isotropic. So this is just like the result that the, uh, if you work out the entropy for gas in, in the room you're sitting in, uh, the entropy is greatest when that gas is homogeneous and isotropic. Um, uh, we don't need a physical mechanism to explain that homogeneity and iso isotropy. The explanation is that it's a typical state. Um, and what we find is that a typical universe is uh, flat, homogeneous, and isotropic. Uh, secondly, uh, also very interesting, the entropy is greatest for a small positive cosmological constant. Uh, the entropy, gravitational entropy, essentially is proportional to one over lambda, as we see for De Sitter space. And um, the calculations are only meaningful, actually, if lambda is positive, and we get the largest answer for the gravitational entropy by taking the smallest cosmological constant, which is similar to an argument uh, Baum, Hawking, and Coleman made a long time ago. Now, I should say I'm saying these rather strongly, these conclusions. Uh, they are very surprising conclusions. They tell you you do not need a mechanism to explain the large-scale geometry of the universe, um, nor even potentially the cosmological constant what you, uh, that's just a result of thermodynamics. Um, I, I, I need to emphasize that so far this is just, you know, the calculation I've described is completely unambiguous, but it gives you a function of the cosmological parameters. Whenever you do thermodynamics, it's very important to be clear about what you fix and what you vary. So you may work at constant volume or constant pressure, a constant particle number, and that second phase of actually using this entropy as a function of the conserved quantities, we have not yet uh, done. And that's very important, especially with regard to number two. Uh, what are you supposed to fix? Do you fix the four volume? Do you fix the 
proper time around this imaginary time loop, you know, what do you fix in order to predict um, the uh, cosmological constant? Uh, so we're still thinking about this. And also to emphasize a kind of surprising aspect of this calculation, the entropy here is really the global entropy for the entire space-time. Uh, it's a fixed number. It doesn't depend on time by Cauchy's theorem. Um, and so, again, this is somewhat unfamiliar. We're, we're, we're usually used to saying this is, you know, such and such a system has a given entropy, and then discussing how that system interacts with another system such that the combined entropy increases, for, for example. But when you only have one universe and you've calculated its entropy, you know, what do you do next? And I should mention here that I'm studying rather carefully now uh, recent work in non-equilibrium thermodynamics, where people who work on much more applied subjects have actually figured out uh, what is the entropy of a, um, a path uh, such as is performed by a, um, a Brown in Brownian motion, for example. So people are now discussing the entropy of a admittedly only a, a Brownian walk in a thermal medium, um, but they have come up with uh, rather good definitions of entropy, uh, which may well generalize to um, cosmology and, uh, and GR. So I think we need some new intuition and probably the best place to get that is from people who actually use entropy to make predictions in uh, more mundane uh, systems. Um, okay, so comparing this with the de Sitter entropy, so this is our calculation. Uh, there was a folklore, or, or even sort of claim theorems, that the uh, if you put stuff into de Sitter space, you decrease the entropy. And indeed, our results are consistent with that. If you put more and more radiation into a de Sitter space, so the horizontal axis is the total entropy in radiation, just the conventional a measure of entropy, um, and that that is conserved. It's at least adiabatically conserved in a, in a in a cosmology. So if we dial that number, and then we ask how does the gravitational entropy vary? It does decrease as you put more and more radiation in, uh, and in fact goes to zero when you get an, the Einstein static universe, where the attraction of the radiation, uh, gravitational attraction of the radiation is balanced by the repulsion of lambda. Um, but in our way of calculating, because we understand the boundary conditions at this singularity, we can continue our calculation to um, space times with a Big Bang type singularity, conformal singularity. And we find this uh, gravitational entropy increases beyond the goes higher than the so-called de Sitter bound. And in fact, whether you're positively or negatively curved spatially doesn't matter as you go to large uh, universes. The gravitational entropy we compute is extensive in the spatial volume at large volume. And so we find if this gravitational entropy is large, it corresponds to a large radiation entropy and a very flat uh, universe. Um, and so, yeah, that's our picture for uh, why the universe is so large and flat. You could say we've just transformed the, that into saying, why does the universe have such a large uh, entropy? Um, okay, so these are some other graphs. This is including matter. Uh, I won't dwell on these, um, but we have calculated all of this in great uh, detail. And the results can also be understood in terms of horizons. I won't dwell on this, but you can literally count the number of horizons, use the de Sitter entropy per horizon. Um, uh, you count the number of horizons at uh, equality between lambda and the other forms of matter. Uh, uh, and then the number of horizons times their area uh, does indeed give you the, uh, the same result for the gravitational entropy that we calculate. Um, I'm going to switch to a different topic now. Uh, now, I'm aware I'm short of time, so maybe you can tell me uh, how much time I have left. You you, you can go, go ahead. We, we, we have one more hour for discussion, oh. so you can take some of that time. All right. But if people maybe want to break now, 
uh, I'm also happy for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, if there are any questions, we can we can take questions. Usually, yeah. the session lasts for two hours, including oh. talk oh, and good. discussion. Oh, so you're we can serious have people. <laughs> we can have a short break if people have questions. Break means we don't go away. We ask okay. you questions and then you continue. So kindly okay. uh, just use the raise hand feature if you have any questions. Yes. Uh, yes, David, please. Go ahead, David. Okay, thanks very much, um, Tijinda, and uh, <clears throat> thank you, Neil. Um, I can ask a question about this mirror universe. So my understanding of a lot of um, bounce models is that they avoid the singularity by not mm. allowing the singularity to go exactly to zero. Um, yes. You you do retain the singularity though, right? Uh, I'm yes. trying how how important is that singularity to attaining these results? If if you kind of smoothed out that singularity, would you lose some of the results? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is a critical thing. Yeah, I I'm not a fan of smoothing out uh, singularity. Right, sure. Um, uh, because uh, analyticity. I mean, well, the way people smooth out singularities is, is extremely violent. Right, because you it add, adding, right against Occam's razor. I suppose you're adding something. Oh, it's 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 truly awful. Um, so yes, what you have to do in order to make the universe bounce is, uh, yeah, is beyond what I'm prepared to do. <laughs> you introduce so many parameters, assumptions, fields, etc., cetera, that, uh, I don't think you have a predictive framework any longer. And if you did that, you would lose many of your results. Yes. All of them. Okay, that was the question. Yes. Yeah. You'd lose yeah. all the results. So. You know, I, I think the, the, the analog would be, um, we know the electric field of an electron is singular, right? So you might be tempted to, in, in, or a, a atomic nucleus, the electric field is singular, you know, the Schrodinger equation has a singularity. And so you might say, oh, we have to smooth that out. So let's introduce some physics, which will prevent the electron falling into the nucleus. Right. Uh, Actually, the resolution of that singularity turned out simply to impose hermeticity on the Hamiltonian and other operators appearing in quantum mechanics. And that imposes a boundary condition at the singularity, which is, you know, with hindsight, very natural, which is that the um, wave function should um, go to, should be analytic at the singularity uh, and have vanishing first derivative. So, yeah. um, you know, that's what I'm looking for, some absolutely compelling boundary condition. Now, wow. we don't understand quantum gravity well enough, but what we see just in classical Einstein gravity is that there is an extremely natural boundary condition, which is this vanishing vial curvature, which is related to the T goes to minus T symmetry around that surface. So just to emphasize, this is really not very singular. Uh, the only thing that's singular is this conformal factor. And the conformal factor is really like a scalar field. You know, and in the Higgs model of uh, symmetry breaking, there's nothing wrong with the Higgs field vanishing. Uh, and the conformal factor is really entirely an analogous to the Higgs field. Um, so the conformal factor of the metric vanishing is not something we should be particularly bothered about. Um, at least the example of the Higgs boson suggests that it's something that may be perfectly normal. Um, and then the conformal four metric is absolutely regular. So, you know, there's no singularity as far as the four geometry goes. It's entirely regular. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think what uh, the, the, the new observation is that by coupling radiation, perfect pure radiation, to Einstein gravity, um, there is actually a rather natural resolution of the singularity. Uh, All right. And so, yeah. Thank so you. I, I, I don't think elaboration in terms of adding lots of other fields and weird forms of matter mm. is, uh, it's, it's not something I want to do. All right, okay, great. Thanks very much, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wesselin, go ahead, please. Hey. Um... I have a few questions that I'll probably bring during the discussion, but now I found it puzzling when you are talking about the entropy 
Yes. Um, I did my own study a while ago trying to kind of get some sense about the cosmological constant doing multiverse calculations and things like this. And the answer was that the average size of the universe would be the Planck scale. Um, and basically this study led me to think that really the Hawking idea relating the entropy could be related to actually to the cosmological constant. Now you're saying that you're expecting a high entropy uh, during the gravitational stage. But my question is really now when you said that when the matter is compatible to the cosmological constant and the, the vacuum energy, uh, that means that it's not actually the Big Bang you're looking on the other side, which is I mean the end, I mean when the universe is kind of becoming very diluted. And and I don't understand how do you relate these two so, things. So so I think I, let me just reiterate what I said before. The entropy is not the entropy of the Big Bang stage. It's not the entropy of a particular phase of the universe. It is the entropy for all time, right? So this of is the total entropy in the universe. It's the total the entropy. It's independent okay. of time. It's a number. So that's okay. the first point to make. Don't think about this as the entropy of the Big Bang or the entropy of some primordial phase or some. It, it, it's it, it's determined by the entire four geometry of the universe. Okay, and, and in fact, the entropy of a black hole is the same. Entropy of a black hole is obtained in exactly the same way by computing the U Euclidean action of the black hole, but it's a four geometry which is being integrated over. The second point um, uh, um, to make is that. Um, Sorry, I've, I've forgotten what uh, what your other question was. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I've forgotten. Well, so, this was related to the cosmological constant, but now your explanation oh. makes sense because the value of this total entropy at the end of the universe when I mean, dark energy is dominating, this actually gives you the entropy there at this stage. Not quite. Okay, so... Uh, some of our referees to our paper wanted to take a shortcut like many referees do and not actually read the paper. And so they said, you're just using the de Sitter entropy, but that is not what we're doing. Okay, so we have a function of radiation, matter, spatial curvature, lambda. It has some, some features in common with the de Sitter entropy, but it really is a function of all the parameters. So, um, yeah, so the other point I wanted to make is that when you do thermodynamics, it's very important to decide what to fix and what to vary. Um, and we haven't reached a decision yet on, so we have a function, a thermodynamic function, but it's a, if you like, it's a function which is a function of the volume, the temperature, the number of particles. Now we want to say, do we want to fix the pressure? in which case we calculate the pressure, fix the pressure, and then predict the number of number, de, number of particles, for example. So um, that second phase, how you use the entropy, we're only just beginning to study. And I must say, there is no literature on this, <laughs> okay? Uh, you're not going to predict everything from thermodynamics without deciding what is fixed. You know, it's like saying, what is a typical configuration for gas in a room? Well, that's a meaningless question, unless you tell me the temperature, or you tell me how much energy there is, or the number of particles, some combination. You've got to tell me something. And um, our calculation is no different. You have to specify something in order to predict something else. So I think the previous discussions have all been at an extremely heuristic level, okay? where even sort of how you use entropy has not really been uh, resolved. But now we do know the entropy, at least we know the entropy as calculated via this Hawking method, uh, we can now figure out how we use it. Um, Thank you. And as I said, the connections with non-equilibrium thermodynamics are very important because this is the entropy of a non-equilibrium system. There's the temperature of the radiation, that's one temperature. There's a Hawking temperature, which is a totally different temperature, much smaller in our universe. And so there are at least two temperatures and you have this dynamical system, which is the four geometry. And this entropy is somehow the 
entropy of the non-equilibrium system. So only in the last uh, 10, 20 years, in fact, there has been some convergence among statistical mechanics people on what the entropy of a non-equilibrium system means um, and in, in simple cases. And they have made some very interesting progress, actually. So I, I think that will be quite fruitful, is to try to connect uh, this entropy. With I, the... I guess we, we will discuss this more uh, later sure. in the discussion. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Please go ahead with your talk. It's 15, okay. Thank you. Be okay, you think? 15 minutes, maybe? Okay, I will try and... Yes. Okay, so this part is probably going to be quite similar. I think Latham has given you a talk already? No, his is in December. Ah, okay. So I will leave it to Latham to talk more, more about this. Uh, it's a very, so I'll just give you a taster. When you couple quantum fields to gravity, um, you hit a mm -hmm. paradox. Yeah, just, just, just quickly to say, you, 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 you're welcome to go through this in as much detail or as little as you <laughs> want, but I, I'll actually be talking about a, a, a different uh, oh, uh, you standard will. model talk. So, oh, okay. so, so feel free to oh, talk okay. more if you want. All right, I'm going to have trouble with time, but I will, so I'm yeah. going to skip over this fairly quickly, but I hope not too quickly. Um, the problem of quantum fields and gravity is that the vacuum energy and pressure are divergent. Here's a picture of the QCD fluctuation, field fluctuations in the QCD vacuum. And this has been known for a long time. A standard approach is simply to uh, throw it away. Uh, through a process of renormalization, but that leaves us with a very unsatisfactory picture of the vacuum. Uh, the, the most sort of dramatic physical problem is that the expectation value of the stress tensor in the vacuum, uh, let's say due to Maxwell fields, is, uh, is a divergent, so this is calculated in point splitting, where the uh, separation between two space-time points is t mu nu is quadratic in the field. So you take two different space-time points and you take their separation to zero in a time-like uh, direction. This is a sort of uh, energy smoothing. Oh, it's, uh, one over delta t is effectively a cutoff in the energy. So it's a very elegant way of calculating this. The calculation is Lorentz invariant, but the answer is not. Okay, so in the vacuum, are sitting these violently fluctuating electromagnetic fields. As delta t goes to zero and you include modes of arbitrary energy, the stress tensor diverges. And even worse, it diverges in a way which is not Lorentz invariant. Um, you can renormalize this away, but it means we actually do not know what is going on in the quantum field theory vacuum. Um, when, we, when we couple it to gravity, gravity sees the divergences. Even worse, this is bad enough, but even worse than this are the vile anomalies where the quantum divergences, these same divergences as delta t goes to zero, spoil the local scale symmetry of Maxwell and Dirac fields. Um, and so these sort of very beautiful features of the theory, which are very important in terms of their, their own quantum behavior, uh, these are spoiled by uh, when we couple them to gravity. And these violations of basic symmetries cannot be renormalized away. So there are deep problems involving couple, coupling standard type of matter to gravity. And what Latham and I have proposed is a new uh, solution to these difficulties. So sorry, Neil, uh, we have a question. David, yes. David, go ahead. Hi. First of all, thank you for the wonderful talk. I really like the explanation of the uniformity of cosmology with from entropy. I think that's beautiful. Um, for my question, I was curious if you have looked into uh, space-time torsion or possibly non-metricity in regards to singularity structure or a coupling of fields, because uh, we, it seems helpful for angular momentum conservation, also um, helps with UV, UV divergences in QED or to make a UV complete theory. Right. So no, I think we've not looked at it in any particular detail ourselves, except, you know, when you do couple fermions to gravity, it's, uh, it becomes very natural to have torsion. Um, and um, indeed, this, you, you know, one should study the boundary conditions 
So we we've, we've studied the effect of these boundary conditions, for example, on vorticity or uh, gravitational wave modes, um, but uh, we've not specifically studied their effect on uh, on torsion. So yeah, I think uh, that that is interesting and work and and well worth doing. Uh, by the way, let let me just mention. I mean, since you've raised this point, I can't help, I can't resist mentioning this Penrose hypothesis that that the vial curvature vanishes here um, may even be observationally accessible in the not too far future. All right, why? Because when we look out, we measure gravitational waves. Currently, we measure them coming from black holes, but of course, the hot plasma of the Big Bang. Uh, it's full of particles jiggling around and radiating gravitational waves. And those waves today would have wavelengths of a millimeter, and they'd form a cosmic gravitational wave background. And that is, in principle, detectable. And in fact, the strain corresponding to those waves is not all that small. It's about 10 to the minus 30, um, which is, you know, many orders of magnitude, but not, given that uh, advanced LIGO is going to get down to 10 to the minus 23, it's, you know, it's not inconceivable that that would be measurable. So what it means is you can literally look at those gravitational waves and see where they came from and see if they were, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the in the standard picture, the gravitational waves would only be thermalized at very early times. So that you, you're literally, when you look at them, you're seeing how what the universe looked like when it was emitted and so for example if there was torsion or 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 other features at that time it may uh, eventually be uh, detectable so uh, that that's a fun uh, fun thing it's about fascinating it. as a brief comment i'll just mention that uh, penrose used to consider a scale transformation on the frame field Correct. and when he did that he had a uh, torsion in there but it seems that he's forgotten about this over time Yes, I think he's forgotten about his vial curvature hypothesis too. Um, I I do meet with Roger very regularly um, uh, since my daughter happens to live nearby uh, where he is, and we we meet up for tea quite often. And I'm trying to persuade him that his older ideas are actually better <laughs> than his new cyclic idea. Uh, I think to some extent he. Um, was provoked by our cyclic hypothesis to make an even better cyclic hypothesis. But I actually think his original idea of this vial curvature boundary condition is is, is an even better one. So uh, we'll see. Um, yeah, you can't blame him. He's 92, I think, and he's had an awful lot of good ideas. So if he's forgotten one or two of them, that, that's uh, perfectly understandable. Definitely. So, so we have one more question. Uh, Burns, please go ahead. Um, I have a question concerning torsion and singularity resolution. I don't know uh, whether you know this, but in some cases you can use torsion to uh, yeah, cure the gravitational singularities of Einstein's general relativity. And uh, do you also think this is ugly or too complicated? Um. Well, when you do introduce torsion, you know, it's not forced on you, and therefore there are free parameters associated with it. So I think, no, I've got nothing against it, but providing you have, uh, you also introduce some principles which, you know, control those free parameters. Um, so so it, it's certainly a natural thing to introduce, but um, I, I would want to see that you got more out than you put in. I say, but I think that the simple way to introduce torsion, the einstein cartan theory, doesn't involve an, any new free parameters. You have a coupling between torsion and uh, and the fermionics, uh, the spin of fermions. This is the only new coupling you get. Otherwise, you get just uh, a modified version of the Einstein Yeah, equation, but, but, but the torsion thing. doesn't remove the singularity generically. The That's torsion. true. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's the worry that you're. Okay. You're okay. You're right about that. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So I, I request that maybe we please have questions now in the discussion so that we let me okay. complete this talk. Thank you. Okay. Um, right. So there were these basic symmetries. So the, the, this part of the talk um, is necessary for me to explain the perturbations, but I warn you, it is it is quite technical. 
Um, and essentially, Latham and I made a observation which leads to some very interesting numerology. Um, and the observation is quite a simple one, uh, in essence, which is that uh, we were interested in vial invariant theories. Why? Because we want to resolve the Big Bang singularity, okay? The, uh, and say that the Big Bang singularity is just singularity of the conformal factor. So let's look at all the theories we know which are vial invariant. So we have uh, uh, fermions, we have gauge bosons. And there's another very interesting theory, which has actually been known for ages. Um, and in fact, recently I found the same theory more or less, is given as exercise one in Bryce DeWitt's famous article on uh, dynamic dynamics of quantum fields uh, in the 60s. So Bryce DeWitt was aware of this, but before him, Heisenberg, Pauli, etc. So the theory is a very simple and, and well-motivated one, which is that the uh, action is just essentially box squared uh, phi box squared phi, or alternatively box phi squared. Um, and so it involves four derivatives and the scalar field therefore is dimensionless because the four derivatives cancel the dimensions in the measure. And, uh, and so this theory was interesting. Why? Because the scalar field is, is uh, dimensionless. Uh, it also has it's a very infrared dominated theory. Uh, the propagator goes as one of a P squared, all squared. So it's very strongly infrared. And for this reason, it has properties which may be useful for confinement and so on. So there were several motivations for thinking about this theory. One, one was confinement, another was just uh, improving the UV behavior of quantum field theory by putting in more powers of P squared. Uh, sorry, yeah, putting higher powers of p squared in the propagator, and so on. Um, now, what, um, from our point of view, why this theory was interesting was, was in fact, uh, I mean, the initial motivation was the very simple point that what we see in the CMB are scalar invariant fluctuations, right? That's what we see. It's remarkable. With this small uh, tilt or critical exponent, but essentially... At first order, they're just perfect scale invariant fluctuations. And if you just ask yourself the very simple question, what kind of quantum field has scale invariant fluctuations? The answer is this one, okay? Because it's dimensionless. And so it's two point correlation function is dimensionless. So if I write it as integral D3K uh, times some power of K, it has to be one over K cubed just by dimensions. And, uh, and, uh, and that's exactly the form we see for the Newtonian potential fluctuations uh, coming out of the Big Bang. So we got interested in this as, you know, is it possible that what we're seeing in the CMB is nothing but the vacuum fluctuations of a dimension zero field? Now, um, so if you take this field, the first thing is it has high derivatives, so people worry about ghosts. When you quantize this theory, uh, the Hilbert space of, uh, if you quantize in uh, covariantly, the Hilbert space includes uh, negative norm states. And so you have to decouple these negative norm states. And in fact, Bogolyubov in and Todorov, uh, I believe who I saw here, uh, wrote a very remarkable textbook on quantum field theory in 1987. Uh, which is which is uh, sort of full of very rigorous mathematical treatment of gauge theories. And the amazing thing is that they identified this theory as the simplest gauge theory. That's how they introduced gauge theory, uh, not with a vector field, but a scalar field. And the point is that this action has an infinite dimensional symmetry, phi goes to phi plus alpha, where alpha is harmonic, and that symmetry can be used to remove the negative norm states, uh, a la Gupta Bloiler. Uh, when you do this, then amazingly, the only remaining physical state is the vacuum. There's only one physical state in this theory, and it's the vacuum, but the vacuum is very interesting because it has these fluctuations. 
So uh, we started to study these fields and we, we asked ourselves, what would happen if we added a bunch of these fields to the standard model? They do not have any particle states, so they don't create any particles. Um, let's just study them at free field order, bunch of dimension zero scalars. So first of all, the vacuum energy. So the vacuum energy okay. has, for massless fields, we get half h bar omega, uh, omega is k, and then times the number of dimension one scalars. Fermions come with a minus sign. Gauge fields, there are two polarizations. And these dimension zero scalars happen to give a factor of two as well. So that's the energy per mode in the vacuum. Secondly, the trace anomaly, which I mentioned before. Trace of the stress tensor should be zero if the theory is vial invariant, it's not zero. And, um, and it's, per, it, it's governed by uh, strings of integers very similar to the vacuum energy integers, except more complicated. So they have funny fraction, there's a funny fraction, and then very strange numbers, 62 and 28 and so on. So these numbers have been well known since the 1970s. So here we have three anomalies in coupling standard model to gravity, vacuum energy, divergent, and then we have these two trace anomalies. And we would love them all to be zero because that would seem to give a more sensible coupling between the standard model and gravity. So we noticed that if we take these sums of four integers and we set them all zero, You've got three equations for four numbers, but the numbers have to be integers. And it's highly non-trivial that there is any solution at all in terms of integers. Um, cancellation of all these three numbers, in fact, implies that the number of fermions is four times the number of gauge bosons. And furthermore, that the number of dimension zero scalars is three times the number of gauge bosons, and that the number of dimension one scalars, that would be a normal Higgs field, is zero. Okay, so that's the conclusion. Now, this prediction or this uh, consequence is very dramatic because if we have 12 gauge bosons corresponding to the gauge group of the standard model, this predicts um, uh, 48 fermions. And 48 fermions is precisely three generations of the known fermions, uh, each generation including a right-handed neutrino. So as far as I know, this is easily the simplest explanation anybody has ever provided for why there are three generations of fermions. And it comes about as a direct consequence of coupling gravity to the standard model and demanding that the uh, vial symmetry is respected and the vacuum energy is zero. So it's quite, quite an amazing coincidence. And by the way, it doesn't work for SU5 or SO10 or... Um, many uh, uh, extensions of the standard model. So now the, the less happy prediction is that there is no uh, fundamental dimension one scalar. It's less happy because I hold the Higgs chair at Edinburgh, but yes. this calculation predicts there is no fundamental Higgs boson. Uh, so I have discussed this with Higgs and he's absolutely happy with it because, uh, you know, his suggestion of the Higgs was motivated by superconductivity in, in which the um, order parameter is not fundamental. It's a, it's a, it's a condensate of, uh, of electrons, uh, of Cooper pairs. And so this, rather than being a problem, may be an opportunity that actually we can explain the hierarchy puzzle by... Uh, understanding how the Higgs is actually a composite made up out of these new dimension zero scalar and other standard model fields. And there seems to be a rather natural way of doing that, but we haven't worked it out yet. Um, promising and related development is in the twister formulation of self-dual gravity, which is a sort of limited version of, of the path integral for gravity um, there are also anomalies. These same anomalies appear or similar anomalies appear. And uh, re very recently, it's been understood how these can be removed to all orders, not just at uh, free field level, 
as, as is done in these calculations, but to all orders by using dimension zero scalars exactly uh, as we're doing. So there's a prospect now that this cancellation, which we discovered, uh, might actually be proven to all orders. Uh, it's still only a possibility, but that's very, very tantalizing. Um, I'll also just mention here that these dimension zero scalars have a very dramatic effect on one loop um, corrections to the graviton propagator. So here's a graviton propagator. If you include standard model matter in, uh, in a loop, it corrects the propagator and you can calculate the one loop correction and then resum all of these uh, diagrams these bubble diagrams uh, to get the final answer. And this is the corrected graviton propagator. And what is not very widely appreciated is the corrected graviton propagator using known uh, fields from the standard model is actually a bit of a disaster, okay? This corrected propagator is actually inconsistent with the cullen lehman representation for a relativistic quantum field and this cullen lehman representation follows from Poincaré invariance and positivity of the phys physical Hilbert space. So very elementary principles. Um, but unfortunately, the one-loop corrected graviton propagator doesn't satisfy those principles. And it, it, uh, it also has complex and acausal poles on the physical sheet. It, it's really very, very bad. What we... Uh, recently noticed is that these dimension zero scalars also cancel this problem. And so uh, standard model plus 36 dimension zero scalars is actually consistent with these basic principles at one loop. And we are now calculating higher loops to see if this consistency um, survives at higher orders. So there's some interesting developments. Uh, I would draw an analogy between this kind of cancellation and the cancellations occurring in string theory. Of course, people got excited about string theory because they found various exciting cancellations at lowest order, many of them at lowest order. And, uh, and we may be seeing something similar with, uh, with Einstein gravity and these funny fields which only alter the vacuum and do not introduce any new particles. So that, that, that seems to be an exciting development. So I'm going to end, uh, I, I hope I have five minutes left. Uh, I'm going to end by explaining how quantitatively the vacuum fluctuations in these funny dimension zero fields um, explain what we see in the cosmic microwave background. So the principle we use is that the trace of the stress energy tensor should be traceless at the Big Bang singularity. Okay, that's exactly what we need in order to resolve the Big Bang singularity. So in the standard model at finite temperature, so beta is the inverse temperature, uh, the trace is not zero. The trace is uh, 3p minus rho. It's not zero due to running couplings. Uh, as you know, running couplings introduce a scale into to particle physics, and the running is described by beta functions. And the beta functions for gauge fields are proportional to the uh, fine structure constant squared. And so in the standard model, there's some particular numerology, uh, this C beta, this uh, coefficient of temperature to the fourth in the trace anomaly is just given by the string of uh, fractions times the coupling constant squared. So we know what the trace anomaly was in the hot Big Bang at uh, at least at, at leading order in the couplings. So it turns out this anomalous trace can be in, can be canceled by adding to the uh, quadratic action of these uh, dimension zero scalars, we can add a linear term. We add a linear term coupled to the trace itself, uh, exactly to this, quantity here. And, um, and then it turns out through a, a sort of clever little calculation, which is the analog of what people do in string theory in 2D, is that by including a non-vial invariant term in the action for these dimension zero scalars, in the classical action, so 
and that term is also linear in, in the dimension zero field, including this term, you can actually cancel the uh, trace anomaly due to running couplings. And, um, and so uh, this is what we did in our paper. Now, why is that interesting to do? Because now you've got an effective action for this, uh, these scalar fields, which includes a piece linear in phi. And phi, if you remember, is scale invariant in the vacuum. It's conformal invariant field, so it's not going to see the expansion of the universe. That field thinks it's living in Minkowski space-time. It has scale invariant fluctuations, and those scale invariant fluctuations are then transport, tran converted. They, they enter the stress energy of this field, and the stress energy is on the right-hand side of the Einstein equations, and that sources curvature perturbations in the universe on large scales. So we worked this out rather simply in our uh, recent paper uh, with all the right numbers. Um, it took a while because it's quite an intricate uh, calculation, but I've since developed this into a much, uh, much uh, more uh, detailed calculation uh, and the numbers uh, all agree. And so this is called the co-moving curvature perturbation. Uh, essentially this, Fluctuating dimension zero scale, uh, field creates a fluctuation in the conformal factor of the metric, um, or, or, conformal or the scale factor of the metric. So, from place to place, this the universe has a slightly different scale factor. Those conformal fluctuations then translate into curvature perturbations on uh, co-moving slices in the universe through a very precise formula. So this produces scalar perturbations. They're adiabatic, Gaussian, scalar. They are no tensor gravitational waves, so we will have no trouble with the Planck, uh, with, with the recent uh, bound on gravitational waves. We predict uh, zero there. Um, and then it turns out you can even predict the tilt of this, um, of the fluctuation by thinking about the running of, uh, of of the couplings. Uh, and so you get an answer, which is alpha squared. I won't go into this uh, in, in great detail, but when you think about it carefully, one of those alphas is a long wavelength alpha, and one is a short wavelength alpha. And to predict the density perturbations, you want to use the long wavelength alpha that runs with scale. And so you, you run the amplitude of perturbations from the Planck length up to the 10 microns, which I mentioned is the is the uh, the co-moving scale of our Hubble volume at the Planck time. So it, it's a it's a it's a sort of extremely ambitious calculation where we're literally just extrapolating everything back to the Planck time and running things in the most uh, naive uh, way, using literally using the running of the standard model couplings, in particular QCD. Uh, and so it turns out that from this calculation, the tilt here, this NS minus one, is slightly negative. And the reason is that QCD is asymptotically free. So as you go to larger distances, the coupling gets stronger. That's why we see larger fluctuations on larger scales in the universe. And uh, we can calculate NS minus one, and it turns out to be minus seven over pi times alpha QCD uh, evaluated at the Planck scale. And uh, uh, so the red tilt here is a critical exponent, which can be calculated perturbatively in, uh, in this framework. We then extrapolate over 30 orders of magnitude in length scale, so, so we, We've extrapolated the standard model to the Planck length, Planck time. We then use the running couplings to extrapolate to 10 microns. And then we simply evolve those forward into the structure we see today. Uh, Maybe here's could I request you to kindly wind up soon so that we have sure. some for discussion? I'm, a, I'm about to finish. So the QCD coupling at the Planck scale is uh, calculated by other people. It's just some number. We use that number. Um, and so here are the results. And so the upshot is that we calculate both the number A, the amplitude, and the NS, and our results are perfectly compatible with the Planck satellite. 
And so that really is a huge surprise. And uh, uh, I can assure you, we did our best to, to do this honestly and fairly, um, and that no, no additional parameters entered the game. Um, we did have to make some choices, but we always tried to make the absolutely simplest choice that would not involve any uh, free parameters. So maybe this is telling us that we actually know where these fluctuations uh, came from. Um, okay, to summarize, the analytic extension of cosmological solutions of the Einstein equations lead to a new picture of the Big Bang as a CPT mirror. We believe we know how to calculate the gravitational entropy for cosmologies. These provide explanations for the famous problems, uh, including homogeneity, isotropy, flatness, and maybe lambda, uh, dark matter. I didn't talk about this. Uh, it's another topic we've worked on. Um, including these strange scalars explains many things. Um, uh, we still need to understand whether they are actually quantum consistent, whether we've really removed the negative norm states, uh, possible ghost instabilities, and so on. And this is something we're actively working on. So thanks. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for a very enjoyable, interesting, and detailed talk. The talk is please open for questions. I kindly use the raise hand feature. Uh, so uh, somehow I can't. Yeah, oh yes, Bunch, please go ahead. So uh, if your model, you have no vacuum energy, the vacuum energy is canceled. Do the scalars play the rule of dark energy then? Or how do you um, explain? I, yeah, I emphasize that's a zeroth order, right? That's free field. Ah, okay. Yeah. So um, what, ha yes. So how do you get a non-zero value for the vacuum energy? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we know yet. Um, okay. The it's related to the issue of how conformal symmetry is broken. You know, it's it's all very well to say you have conformal symmetry at the Big Bang, mm -hmm. and that resolves the singularity. But ultimately, we have to explain where the scales come from. Both the weak scale, which is related to the Higgs field rev, and the cosmological constant. And uh, ah, okay. So you after symmetry breaking, you also get an infrared scale. Give them exactly. A, okay, exactly. The, a cosmological constant. Okay, thank you. Exactly. So I don't think we've got a good answer to either of those questions yet. Uh, but it's a very, very fundamental issue. How does conformal symmetry get broken? Um, in fact, I was interviewed for a PhD place by Roger Penrose a long time ago, and uh, and. Uh, I didn't know anything about twisters. So Roger said, so I said, I wanted to work on twisters. So Roger said, oh, well, what problem do you want to work on? I said, well, what's the hardest problem in twister theory? And he said, it's explaining uh, masses. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so I said, okay, I want to work on that. And, and, and he looked at me like, like, you know, I can't solve that problem. So what chance have you got? <laughs> so it's a tough problem but, the but um but i yeah i guess one hopes that using some intuition based on the higgs mechanism mm -hmm. um another point about these dimension zero scalars is they are actually very well known in 2d okay. so in 2d the world sheet coordinates of a string are dimension zero scalars because it's d2 sigma and the action has two derivatives. So now we know very well that, that if we take those dimension zero scalars and exponentiate them, we get vertex operators. And so vertex operators are how you introduce uh, you know, photons and gravitons and their interactions in string theory. So you okay. can do the same with dimension zero scalars in 4D. You can exponentiate them and obtain fields of non-trivial scaling dimension like dimension one scalars. Mm -hmm. um, and so there seems to be a new possibility for constructing composite. Um, I mean, in string theory, the graviton is a composite made out of string. Uh, and uh, 
and and it could be the same in 4D with these dimension zero scalars. But okay, so for this is actually didn't... explained in Bogolyubov and Todorov's uh, textbook, amazingly. Mm -hmm. But um, they don't really in discuss interactions. They don't really discuss gravity. Okay, so, then. Uh, thank I you very much. And good luck. New, new direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead, Anthony. Please go ahead. Hi, Neil. Thank thanks very much. Hi, Anthony. Hi there. Um, I wanted to talk about, to you about the power spectrum, the microwave background, and Great. what you were saying about how the peaks give no evidence for inflation. Yes. And just to try and understand how it works in your setup, because yes. the, the popular idea, of course, is that the peaks certainly are providing evidence for inflation, because in order to see peaks in a power spectrum like that, you need the fluctuations phased up so that right. they effectively start from rest. Right. coming into the horizon, right. having been blown up outside the horizon, provides right. the mechanism for doing that. Right. Uh, that seems to say that inflation is necessary right. uh, in order to put them above the horizon scale. Now, how, how do you get the same predictions without talking about those mechanisms? Uh, we get exactly the same prediction, but in a far simpler way, <laughs> okay. which is that um, these CPT symmetric boundary condition. Uh, in other words, that the metric should have a T goes to minus T isometry. Uh, that automatically excludes the decaying mode. And so um, if you exclude the decaying mode, you automatically get the peaks in the right place. So uh, it, it also excludes vorticity. Um, and so in, in our picture, um, yeah, the, the, so in our picture, the the um, uh, the the modes we see are simply those which respect uh, CPT symmetry, and it's okay imposing it right at that very initial point, rather than at some later point, which is when inflation has its effect. In yes. terms of the you know, coming no, within, it, within the horizon happens much later normally. No, exactly. So these modes are, of course, outside the in standard radiation dominated universe. The modes we are seeing now were way outside the yes. Hubble radius, and um, and so their evolution is extremely uh, simple. Uh, they're not oscillating or anything, and so we impose this time t goes to minus t symmetry at t equals zero. And it just picks the right modes. And you don't need to inflate them then. I think that's what I'm trying no, to do. No, you don't. Um, in fact, it's 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 almost um no, you don't inflation is is completely um unnecessary in the in this framework. So um uh, in fact, you know, I think what what's also interesting is that as so I've been thinking about this recently, is about the cosmic gravitational wave background. And if one were able to observe it, which of course is extremely challenging, but as a matter of principle, you know, so was the CMB challenging uh, for decades. If one were able to measure it, you would literally look back and see um, the primordial uh, boundary conditions on those modes. Now, in the case of inflation, what you would see in the power spectrum is a heavily diluted um, short wavelength gravitational wave spectrum because of inflation right and then you would see um, um you would see that as the universe is re-thermalized really after inflation uh well probably you wouldn't see anything because the temperature would be too low to emit gravitational waves so it would just wipe them out whereas if the radiation dominated epoch extended all the way back to the big bang you um you know what you what you could see is the is the thermal gravitational wave background, and then the effect of the boundary condition would would hopefully be uh, you know uh, observable um, because yeah you'd be seeing all the way back to the Big Bang. So, um, but but yeah the the upshot is that inflation is completely unnecessary if you if you buy this explanation for the large scale geometry as just being the maximum entropy geometry could, could i just uh, interject uh, neil uh, 
Uh, it's good to get rid of the inflaton. I'm happy. But have you not sort of smuggled in the inflaton back as these dimension zero scalars because you need them to explain density perturbations? Uh, you could say that, but um, uh, I think the you could indeed say that. I mean, the inflaton field does have a power spectrum of one over k cubed. Uh, actually, it's dimension one, so expectation value of phi squared goes like Hubble squared over k cubed, um, and that gives um, Hubble squared. Yeah, so that uh, the, the 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 dimensions of the field are counted for by the Hubble constant in inflation. Um, but I think that would be wrong because. Um, the motivation for introducing these fields, our motivation was to improve the uh, coupling of gravity to the standard model. Now, there is absolutely no evidence, as far as I know, that inflatons improve the coupling of the standard model to gravity. Uh, for example, in the trace anomaly, they make it worse. Um, and in fact, if you go back to the very first sort of detailed paper doing calculations in quantum gravity, that was the famous Tuft Veltman paper, they ask, they were very interested in divergences and are there divergences in quantum gravity? And if you add extra fields, do those divergences get better or worse? And they argue in the final section of that paper that including minimally coupled scalar fields makes the divergences much worse, mm -hmm. okay? Whereas including conformally coupled scalar fields mm -hmm. does not make them worse. Mm -hmm. uh, Bryce DeWitt actually makes the same point that Bryce DeWitt in his review article from the 70s shows that the vacuum energy due to a um, minimally coupled field um, uh, leads to horrible divergences in between the two plates. Um, the vacuum energy uh, density diverges and it's not in integrable. Uh, whereas if you make the fields conformally coupled like the Maxwell field, uh, everything is much better behaved. So these are just some indications uh, which, which are worth following up that maybe introducing inflatons or similar dimension one scalars like the Higgs makes the UV properties of uh, matter plus gravity worse. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas introducing a dimension zero scalars does the opposite. It makes it better. So, but we would still call let this, let's say beyond standard model physics. Yes. And how, how would uh, the, we ask experimentalists to look for these dimension zero scalars because- well, they, Exactly. So they have no particles. Um, they can mediate forces. Okay. So uh, this is very futuristic. But for example, if you look at the um, uh, binary pulsars, mm -hmm. they have extremely uh, strong magnetic fields. Uh, some of them have extremely strong magnetic fields. And it is conceivable that those magnetic fields distort the QED vacuum strongly enough that um, that you will actually alter the force between these two orbiting pulsars. Uh, so I, I'm just really speculating here, but it, it is conceivable that in these sort of natural laboratories, which nature provides, one will be able to measure um, effects on the vacuum energy of various fields. So it would, would you call it a fifth force kind of thing? Yes, but it's a but it's a strange fifth force. Um, you see, these dimension zero fields, we know they have to condense in the vacuum anyway to form the Higgs boson. So they have to condense. Uh, you want to study what is the effect of the condensed uh, dimension zero scalar in the vacuum. So yeah, we don't know how to do that uh, yet. Um, but but. I, I think given that they have this dramatic effect on the vacuum, in mm -hmm. particular canceling the infinity, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's well, well worth uh, trying to figure out what they do and, and might what they do eventually be detected. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Next, Wesley, please go but, you, but you won't find them in a particle accelerator. Ah, okay. I, get I doubt. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I just okay. interject one, 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 yeah. one follow up to Neil's comment? I mean, one of the things in in the uh, is that uh, you know we, we find this relationship between the parameters of the standard model and the uh, and the parameters of the primordial power spectrum, the amplitude and the tilt. So that that's something that's that's a relationship that's compatible with observations, but by doing that calculation more precisely and also measuring all of those parameters, both the cosmological and fundamental parameters, precise more and more precisely, you know, that's a that's a test that will be very non-trivial if it if it continues QCD, to pass. Sorry, alpha QCD and NS, I think, yeah. For example, exactly. yeah, for for currently the leading order term in, in alpha, exactly. But but also there's a, a second formula relating the the observed amplitude is ten to the minus five. The observed of delta perturbation of density perturbations in the CMB to another function that that Neil briefly flashed about in terms of standard model parameters. So that that yes, also yes. has to remain. Yes, yes. In principle, there's another there's yet another formula that we haven't worked out yet for the for alpha s the running of the spectral index, which. So right. far, hasn't been observed to be non-zero, but eventually could right. be. So that that's it's is we think it's predicted to be very small the the running of the NS, but we haven't yeah. calculated it. Thank you, Vesselin, please. Yes, thank you. This is very interesting, uh, but I, I want to go back to the inflation because that's where we started. Then I was wondering. Uh, I mean. Did, did you look at the Weinberg condition for inflationary kind of period, uh, which was, uh, I think, uh, the rate of change of the Hubble parameter over the Hubble parameter squared and when it's big or smaller than uh, one? Uh, Sorry, why why would we look at that? We just have a radiation-dominated universe. Right. Well, the, the reason is because we were studying with Professor May the, the scavenger and vacuum idea of him where the scale factor, conformal scale factor is important, the key player there. Uh, but because of homogeneity, isotropy depends only on time, and therefore you cannot really have a normal particles. But then it turned out that when you look at this and match it to how it behaves with the energy density and things like this, you can actually connect it to inflationary because you can compute what is the rate of change. And then we see naturally in our framework, this condition will go one over t, power of t, which means that when your t goes to zero, eventually you would have inflationary stage. But then as time evolves, you would outgrow it because your time would actually exceed the value close to zero and it will become bigger than one at some point. Are um, you thinking about inflation in the future? I mean, no, no, in the past. It. In the past. So we but, don't have any. I mean, it just comes in the condition that it shows that within what we were looking at this field is saying that there, there should be kind of inflationary stage, although you don't need fields or processes, but just the rate, the, the Hubble uh, parameter changes is saying, well, this is look like inflationary stage. Our hypothesis is that there is no inflationary stage. I mean, mm -hmm. we, but we... I guess the only way to know it is to compute the, the, the Weinberg condition and see what you get with your within your model for this condition? Well, we we know how the stress tensor behaves, so I'm I'm not sure it, it's mm. never inflationary. You know, we know that it's not inflationary. If okay. the stress tensor is traceless, then you have pure radiation. So mm. that 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 is our hypothesis that the mm -hmm. exact stress tensor of the matter is traceless as you go to the Big Bang. And that means you have perfect radiation and you have exact conformal symmetry at the Big Bang, and that allows you to resolve the Big Bang singularity. So mm -hmm. I think more or less by assumption, we we are excluding inflation. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sad to see it go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you haven't computed the, the Hubble rate, the, the change, and to see how this would... No, we have. We've, we've solved the Einstein equations. These uh, mm -hmm. instantons are exact solutions of the Einstein equations all the way back to t equals zero. Okay. Uh, I'll yeah. probably send you email and look in the papers to see what please. you think. Yeah, please. And if I may, because I don't see anyone. Oh, that's uh, 
Ben yeah. So I'll let somebody else ask the question. Okay. I was going okay. in the direction. Bunt, please go ahead. Uh, what about David? I think you also wanted to ask ah. something before I. So maybe David, David should has go many before comments. me. Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. There's some uh, comments. David, uh, would you like to say something? Oh, I, I just was curious um, for this uh, for this dimension zero scalar. Do you see any relationship with the quartic structure with potentially a uh, elasticity theory? Yes, absolutely. That's a very good point. So it happens that people who study conformal field theory, which is now a big industry, um, have been uh, worrying about theories which are very similar to this. And so there's a recent paper, Latham will remember the reference uh, better than me, but there's a recent paper. I know Chris one Mim of the authors is Chris, Chris Hertog, uh, Herzog, Herzog. Um, Herzog. I'm forgetting the other authors. Yes, C. Herzog, H-E-R-Z-O-G, I think. And uh, so they were motivated precisely by elasticity theory. Um, and what they did, if they, they've studied the basically stress energy correlators and 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 uh, and other correlators in in four derivative theories they usually call these theories non-unitary okay so these theories have become known in the condensed matter it's quite a big condensed matter literature in fact it's sort of really grown in the last five years of computing um uh correlations and critical exponents in four derivative and higher derivative theories. So this is now quite an industry using um, uh, um, uh, epsilon expansion and other techniques from critical phenomena. Now they usually call these theories non-unitary. And the reason is that certainly when, uh, so the condensed matter people typically deal with purely Euclidean theories. Um, but if you take one of these theories, which is perfectly well defined in Euclidean space, it has a positive action and so on. If you take it and then analytically continue to uh, Lorentzian space, you do find negative norm states. Okay, and that's why they're called non-unitary. But from our point of view, there's a sort of second question is when I get, you see, you would almost do the same with a with a gauge theory, let's say I did a U1 gauge theory in Euclidean space, and I compute the correlator of A mu with A nu, and then I go back to Lorentzian time, I would find that the A0 correlator was negative. And so, so that again, you'd say is not unitary, but of course that's just QED. And we know how to get rid of the negativity there. It's gauge symmetry. So, um, so you'll, you'll find a rather large literature on non-unitary Euclidean field theories with higher derivatives. And this has become a yeah, big industry recently. So we've been very, very interested in that. And uh, indeed, I think the idea this is somehow elasticity is, is, uh, is really interesting. Um, Thanks for sharing that. I'll just briefly mention that metric affine gravity is a relativistic elasticity theory in some sense. Okay, very interesting. Which it because has I, curvature, torsion, and non-neutricity. Oh, uh, very interesting. Thank you. No, um, indeed, uh, I think one thing that bothers us about these dimension zero fields is we don't have a good geometrical interpretation. <laughs> we just throw them in, you know, and we don't know what they mean. So, uh, yeah, that's a very, very good suggestion. Great. Thank you. Bernd, please go ahead. So uh, first of all, up on inflation and your model. So if uh, you showed that at the beginning of the universe, your model is expanding linearly. If this continues to expand linearly all up to today, to today, today, it would solve yes. the problems. Uh, inflation theory was invented for to solve this problem. So you would have no horizon problem if the universe is a coasting universe, if the scale factor just uh, scales linearly. No. No, no, that's a standard radiation universe. It's in conformal time. Ah, okay, okay. So in proper time, it goes like t to the half. Okay. Right. So it, you're right. If it was proper time, it would be. If know, it were a proper time, yes. Al okay. Almost superluminal, but it's 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 not. Yeah, it's conformal time. Ah, so okay. in conformal time, it's linear, um, which which yeah. So from our point of view, the important thing is it's analytic at t equals zero. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but um, uh, yeah, it doesn't solve a horizon problem. There's still a, a big horizon problem, but we, okay. Okay. what we claim is that the horizon puzzle is solved because the maximum entropy universe is homogeneous and isotropic. And there is no horizon puzzle. Ah, because, because from the, it's, it's, from the beginning, it's just okay. the typical universe. So yeah, you've got to take this point of view that instead of worrying about initial conditions and what's the measure on initial conditions, you worry about what is a typical four geometry. Okay. Okay. If you find the typical four geometry is homogeneous and isotropic, then there is no horizon problem in the initial conditions because ah, okay, it mm -hmm. is what it is. So you, so, would, uh, you would have no uh, horizon problem to start with because the initial conditions yeah. solved the problem right from the start. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. And it's a, you know it it is a change of mindset because um, it, as I try to indicate, you know, if you formulate the problem like I have freedom to impose any initial conditions on the universe at the Big Bang, if you formulate it that way, then almost certainly you need inflation. Mm -hmm. But that seems a ridiculous way to formulate the problem because you're you're formulating initial conditions precisely at the point where you don't know what you're doing because the quantum gravity fluctuations are very large, and they're certainly right. not classical. Okay, yeah, so not at a Planck scale yet. So whereas when you do thermodynamics, you're summing over all configurations, and in a certain sense, the future influences the past. Okay. In this uh, thermodynamic, in this gravitational thermodynamic ensemble, the future does influence the past, um, and and I'm quite interested in ideas of uh, of uh, Yakir Aharonov uh, of Aharonov Bohm experiment. So he works on quantum foundations, and he uh, develops the notions of pre and post selection. You have mm -hmm. a time thermometric formulation of quantum theory where you have exactly. final and initial boundary conditions. You... Exactly, yeah. exactly. So Aronoff argues that, in fact, to explain the universe, we do need some kind of post-selection, meaning that there's some future boundary condition, you know, to the future of us, to us and okay. that this actually does have influence on the past. So it's kind of heretical, um yes. given our normal classical notions of physics but it's it it is where thinking about quantum mechanics leads you that's true um, and i mean it uh, uh, also has a good historical background something like this was also tried by wheeler and and Feynman when they formulated time symmetric electrodynamic so it has yes not yes yes exactly Exactly. So Latham is a expert on 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 this uh, Wheeler Feynman theory, and we we have thought about it for quite a while. I can't resist telling you a little story. When I first went to Princeton as an assistant professor, I had lunch with John Wheeler, and I said to him, "What do you think about inflation?" <laughs> and uh, John Wheeler said, "No, it's a complete confusion." He said, uh, and he, he wrote some equations and he said, you know, it's just a, it's a misinterpretation. So I said, well, what do you think explains the flatness puzzle? And he said, oh, the universe is flat because of an observation somebody will do, uh, uh, you know, five billion years in the future. <laughs> ah, yes, he had this idea of the self-referential universe where you have this eye, oh, which right. is looking back at the Big Bang. I, I remember this drawing he has uh, yes. in his books. Yes, so, exactly. Uh, so he was. Exactly. So, so I am very much influenced by Wheeler's uh, thinking about the path integral for gravity. Okay. And I think his ideas, even though they sound really crazy, they need to be taken quite seriously. I have uh, two follow-ups, one on, on, on Wheeler. Yeah, uh, Bernd, if you I... don't mind, could we go to Vaseline and then... Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, 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 I'm sorry. Of course, you can. Uh, yes, I don't mind at all. Sorry. Please go ahead, Vaseline. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, th this is going back a little bit to the thermodynamics you mentioned. And basically there is observation and I would like to hear your opinion on this that, for example, I mean, of course we know reparameterization invariant theories like gravity are important when you look at uh, relativistic particle. Uh, but then we have troubles with the Hamiltonians there and things like this. And 
And when I was looking into this, um, then I noticed something quite interesting. Actually, thermodynamics is the flat, simplest representation invariant theory because it's differentials only of first order. I see. Uh, so what is your feeling about the relationship of thermodynamics? Because it's in everywhere around us, but we don't really appreciate the fact that it's actually representation invariant also. <laughs> No, that's an interesting point. Um, I mean, I have been worrying about path integrals and what they mean uh, with with one eye on gravity and trying to understand if it makes sense and sort of came to the conclusion that Lorentzian path integrals with interference and so on is the way to look at, look at things. But um, if you try to formulate path integrals rigorously, you are led to worry about the diffusion equation, right, which is of course, the origins of it are in thermodynamics and Brownian motion. And, and so again, when, when thinking about this non-equilibrium thermodynamics, my instinct would be to go back to you know, much simpler thermodynamic systems like a Brownian particle and try to figure out, um, you know, do we understand entropy in that context? Um, so that, that's the lines along which I'm thinking. Um, I'm 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 less uh, formal uh, than you are. Uh, I I I want to gain insight from real physical ph phenomena whenever possible. But um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't have anything profound to say, uh, except that the fundamental puzzles in thermodynamics are extremely fundamental, and uh, you know. Um, and very certainly when you think about the universe and cosmology, you have to tackle them. You see, in a way, this is the reason I've never been a fan of inflation, is it's, it seems to me more like a cheap trick. Uh, we have some uh, inconvenient uh, puzzles about the universe, and so we just invent a mechanism which we think sweeps them away. Um, but, you know, if you look a little bit deeper you realize it didn't really solve them. So for example, Penrose makes the point in, in, a, in a system with reversible dynamics, um, then dynamics alone never uh, explains why uh, certain configurations will dominate. Mm. Uh, so so you, you, know, you could just take a lumpy universe today, write down any inflation model you liked and trace the present universe back into the past and it would correspond to some initial condition. And since you don't have a measure on initial conditions, you you, you have no reason to exclude that universe. So uh, yeah, issues of reversibility, time reversibility and thermodynamics are absolutely fundamental to cosmology. And uh, I, I hope they, you know, they can be more fruitful than, than they have been in inflationary models where I think the rule has been basically, I'm going to assume some convenient set of initial conditions where I won't have to worry about these issues. And for me, that's not really solving the problem. Thank you. On a different, slightly different note, Neil. Uh, so about the electroweak symmetry breaking scale, where yes. the symmetry is restored, you yes. don't have any further unification until you reach the Planck scale. Exactly. That's our and over there you will unify the forces. There is some underlying theory. Or oh, would yes. you oh, okay, okay. Yes, exactly. I mean, if you simply take the experimental values for the couplings, I, I flashed it quickly, and you follow the strong and the weak and the uh, sorry, the SU3, SU2, and U1 couplings, you know, they're they're very similar at the Planck time. Yeah. That certainly suggests something unified them. We are not, uh, I guess our hypothesis would be that whatever did unify them was really involved with the fundamental structure of space-time and the Planck scale and so on. And we are hoping to avoid having to deal with that just by using analyticity. Yeah. You know, if, if your theory is an complex analytic, then rather than running time back to the Planck time, you might imagine you can avoid the Planck time by going on a contour which just misses uh, and stays away from, let's say, the fundamental discreteness of space-time and matter. So that's our kind of hope. 
that by being much more naive and just using the Einstein equations and the standard model and relying and, and, and trying to make sure we can always implement analytic analytic behavior, we yeah, can somehow- very, That's very interesting, yes. And yeah, so there's, can no avoid... scale, there's no gut scale, there's no grand unification. No, it's all the Planck scale. I mean, that yeah. that's that's much more plausible, honestly. I, I think so too. I think <laughs> right. between Planck scale and the electroweak scale, to my understanding, there's nothing. Right. That's, right. That, that's how I feel more comfortable. I would say it a bit differently. I would say there is no evidence for anything. Yes, yes. Oh, I, I meant that. Yes, I meant that. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes, yes. yes. So uh, okay. why, why start yeah. inventing things when there's yes. no evidence? I, I I agree with that. I agree. Yes. Yeah. But we can come back to you, please. Uh, to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. We're in the, really nice. I just have some uh, historical follow ups. One is uh, on David and the scalar field and non metricity. Uh, so the dilaton is also related to non metricity. There was a paper in the 1970s where they showed that the dilaton is related to the while non-metricity tensor. And if you go back to the original works on Kaluza Klein theory, there was even a PhD te thesis uh, in 1951 by Günther Ludwig, so a German theoretical physicist. Uh, his uh, mentor was Pascal Jordan. And in this I see. he showed that, uh, that you, if you introduce a scalar, if you use the scalar field of the dilaton, then you also have non-metricity and a four-dimensional uh, sub-manifold of a five-dimensional uh, Space time. But what was his name? Günther Ludwig. Maybe I can write it in the chat. Okay, Ludwig. Uh, the other interesting thing about this guy is, and now we're coming back to time symmetric uh, formulations of uh -huh. uh, theories, he quantized the uh, Wheeler uh, Feynman absorber theory. So he developed a quantum version of the Wheeler Feynman absorber theory also in the 1950s. So he was quite okay. busy together with his PhD students in Berlin. Okay. At this time, so unfortunately, okay. so his original works are all in German. It might be a get a little <laughs> trouble, <laughs> uh, but maybe there's some way to get the information forward anyway. So, yes, I, I must say, in this whole exploration, we've been time and again going back to rather ancient uh, literature. Um, you know, there was a lot of very, very good stuff in the past, and then. For various reasons, it was um, forgotten. Uh, actually, a very good example is the the best papers on the path integral for gravity were written by Claudio Teitelboim in uh, the late 70s and early 80s. There's one, a few papers in 1982. And these are really tour de force, very elegant, very fundamental, very clear, formal papers. But of course, what happened is that in the early 80s, and I later became friends with Claudia Teitelboim, who's an extraordinary person. But what happened is in the early 80s, grand unified theories were the fashion. And then inflation came. And then string theory came. And everybody forgot about the path integral for Einstein gravity. Yeah. And his papers were absolutely ignored. <laughs> So, okay, so, so with Ludwig, the problem was basically the language barrier. So he wrote his original papers all in German. Later on, right. he wrote many uh, very complicated monographs on the axiomatics of quantum theory, which are all in English. But <laughs> his stuff from, I from on Kaluza Klein theory and quantum electrodynamics are still in German. So that's yes. kind of like, yes. maybe I can try to translate a little of his work. Or may we also have deep sure. or something like this. So maybe this helps. Sure. I mean, I think the idea that we have the answers now is something we should, <laughs> we careful, should uh, yeah, so. not be so sure of. Uh, at yeah, least but, uh, all the developments of the last 10 years have uh, convinced me, you know, I was director of Perimeter Institute and, and responsible for basically deciding which areas to grow and, and not to grow. But um, so I had to think about all these questions quite carefully, but you know, the fact, is, simple fact is, for the last forty years plus, there's not been one successful prediction from proposed frameworks for fundamental physics, not one. Uh, and so I think everybody needs to be very humble and to say, you know, actually, there's we we're not sure we know what we're doing. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's I agree with you, Neil. But how how can we try to bring a turnaround? Sociologically. Again? There's a resistance to... Oh, there's a terrible resistance and uh, dogmatism and uh, insecurity. Um, it's uh, No, it's very difficult. I, I think it's happening. Uh, honestly, this is my impression. It's steadily happening, particularly with younger people. The more thoughtful younger people are not buying the, uh, the sales pitch. And... Um, but I think you know it will take time, and uh, one just has to keep asking uh, you know physical questions and uh, conceptual questions, um, and uh, yeah, eventually the the interesting stuff does come to the fore. I I'm an optimist by nature, but um, it's very noticeable, for example, that the best feel best people in certain fields. So, I mean, just as random examples, Ed Witten, for example, or uh, let's say uh, Svi Byrne who's doing scattering amplitudes or, you know, the people who are most expert, if you get them on their own <laughs> and in a quiet place <laughs> and you say, do you really believe in this? <laughs> you know, they will start confessing about the, uh, you know, the uncertainties. And, but I, I wish the confession was public because yes, only it's that not. will lead to a turnaround. If it's, the public it's, yes, it's it's related to funding. It's related to funding. Having having declared that we have the ultimate theory, and received a lot of funding for it, you know, people feel obliged to keep uh, saying you that. Know, I like to think that suppose suppose Einstein was a string theorist. In 1984, he said, ha, we had the string revolution. When he found out he, it doesn't work, he would be the first one to say, guys, this is the wrong path. Let's start afresh. Totally agree. Yeah, so th totally this, agree. I wish, I wish with the current leaders, it was like with Einstein. Yeah. He wouldn't, we... care, he wouldn't care about funding, you see. No, funding no. comes next. First no. comes physics. Right. No, it, it, it is a big problem of our age. It's a big problem. And I think what we have to do is create pockets of resistance, uh, you know, in, in like your seminar is one, um, in you. which we, but ultimately the best ideas will win. I, I feel confident of that. And, and I feel that at the moment, you know, string theory is not generating uh, the best ideas. So I hope that by focusing more on 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 foundational questions, uh, we will will produce uh, better alternatives. Yeah, there was an interesting debate, for example, between Brian Green and uh, Roger Penrose. On yeah, I Russia. saw that one. I saw that one. <laughs> I, saw I that just one. watched it on the weekend, and yeah, uh, it was quite one. amusing. Uh, yeah. A little bit in the last few months, I'm seeing statements from particle physicists and stringy people. String theory may not be the ultimate fundamental theory of nature. Yes. It's yes. coming out in very recently, in the last yes. few months. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. I mean, one of the main advocates of uh, supersymmetry was a Russian in Minnesota. I've I've forgotten his name. He's now in Minnesota, but he's an expert on supersymmetry breaking from instantons and so on. And he wrote uh, lecture notes, this is about five years ago, for a summer school. Um, and the heading of one of the chapters was The Lost Generation. Okay. Yes. And what he was saying is that there's a whole generation of particle physicists who went into supersymmetry. They did a huge amount of work, calculation. And then LHC turned on. And all that work is irrelevant. Yes. Uh, and, and so, again, as I say, the very best people often do realize that, uh, th that what they've sold is not, uh, you know, and, and, and the best among them will admit that. Yeah. No, I remember a few, few months before Steven Weinberg died, he had an interview with Andy Strominger. In that interview, Strominger says, 
within a couple of years from 1987, everybody knew that string theory is not going to give the standard model. Okay. He says we knew that already then, but right. you know, we, nobody said it openly. If I had, <laughs> if I had right. said this openly, it would make progress. Right. No, I think string theory will come to be seen as a very beautiful laboratory for playing with gravity and uh, and fields and, and conformal invariance and so on. Um, and one can learn lots from the tricks they have used. Also, I think I think there's something fundamental there. Fun elementary particles are excitations of ex extended objects like strings and two brains. Sure. I think that will survive. Mm -hmm. But from there, how to develop a quantum field theory which gives you the standard model? I think they went wrong there. Compactification right. and Edwards in his talk that yes. uh, compactification is not the way forward. So I asked Stephen Hawking when I was in Cambridge, I said, do you, do you actually believe in extra dimensions? And he was absolutely dismissive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, it's a complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. And uh, my PhD advisor was David Olive, who was one of the three co-authors on the first paper on super strings, the mm -hmm. Goddard Church Olive projection mm -hmm. on super string vertices. And I asked him, do you believe in extra dimensions? And he said, no, no, it's complete nonsense. So, um, yeah, it was a stand-in, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, I think it was quite predictable that when you introduce, you know, when you, you start denying the, when you start making certain dimensions small, just so that you can't see them, mm -hmm. um, you, you've slightly lost your track. Yeah. yeah. But if those dimensions are of the range of the strong force or the weak force, right? What is called large extra dimension, right? That still be okay, perhaps, right? Sure, that's right. Yeah, it's when you really mean... hide them. Yes, yes, yes. Then you might you're in danger of self delusion. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. Uh, so great. So are there? Sorry, sorry for the digression. Are there no more problems, please? Otherwise, we can wind up. Okay. Uh, wow. Well, thank you so a, much. Great. great to have you with us, Neil. Thank and you very much. My, from, thank you. <laughs> thank from you. My, yeah, for my uh, co-participants, the next talk will be on September 29th. David Chester will talk on E8. I think it'll oh, be quite great. fascinating. Yeah. We I'll have join had, you. We had I'll a few you. E8 talks in this meeting. So thank, thank you, you all. Thank you very much. I'll close the meeting. Good night. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tajinda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.